so you mentioned that all of the crises in the world in India, and or all of the crises that the world is facing and that India is facing, what opportunities do you think fair trade and a fair trade business model has to fight these crises? I think, I think the fair trade movement faces a number of new challenges if it wants to go much further than where it is now. Obviously, there is there are elements of fairness and justice to the model that the fair trade movement has brought to the world in the last few decades. But I think that there are very new challenges which make it impossible for you to achieve a, a lasting success unless you're also engaging with and addressing those challenges. For instance, your constituency, your constituency is of you know, small producers, small farmers, artisans, um, woodworkers, uh, fishermen, or, or say, potters and weavers. Now these constituencies are devastated by much larger global practices and not just restricted to trade. So the worldwide agrarian crisis, the collapse of smallholder farmers, that's, that's one set of problems. To the worldwide crisis of water that is affecting all human beings and non-human beings as well, but particularly crushing small producers and small farmers. That the crisis of employment as agriculture is losing a lot of livelihoods. So these sort of challenges that make it's imperative for us to be able to engage with, address these challenges in order for the fair trade model to go much further because you cannot have fairness in one sector with injustice and unfairness in all the surrounding territories. You also mentioned that if the UN could spend $80 million to solve, $80 billion, $80 billion to solve many of the world's problems, um, that they could solve their problems. But do you think that this through a model like Fair Trade could solve some of those problems? The show was good. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm saying that you can be part of that solution, not the whole of it. So, and I'm also saying you cannot solve even the problems of your sector without engaging with those larger problems. So that's what I'm saying. These are too closely interlinked. The linkages between these different problems are very intricate. Now what the UN does is it puts out a menu or a bill each year. So the General Secretary says 15 to 20 billion dollars, by which I mean additional expenditure each year, recurring. Okay? Say suppose you're spending 40 billion dollars now, you need to spend 55 billion dollars. So suppose the world finds 15 billion dollars. Every child can go to school, up to class 5. If the world finds $20 billion, portable water and sanitation will be available to every human being. In that sense, an additional expenditure of $80 billion will address some of the most basic problems of the human race. We, for 30 years, the UN has been telling us this, but we've never had the money. We've had downsizing, we've had cuts in welfare expenditure, we've had all these problems. We don't have the money, that's what governments say. But when Wall Street hits the fan, yeah, oh, then you have $8 trillion of public money handed over to a bunch of criminals because they're too big to fail. Right. So what my, the point I'm trying to make is the money is there. It's that, who are you wanting to spend your money on? Corporations or communities? That's right. And, yes, Wall Street is essentially full of people who epitomize not fairness but fraud in trade. 
So yes, so I think it even becomes more important to have fair trade models and also to confront the fraudulent model. You can't, you can't play in your own sandbox. You have to engage with it.